So uh, welcome all of you. So happy to have you here. Uh, thank you very much to Blackstone Library. This is Janet who coordinates all this. And of course, to our distinguished uh, speaker, Mr. Dennis Pelican. A uh, few notes before we start. Um, first off, we have our annual meeting, if you remember the Brantford Historical Society, uh, the 16th next week. It, and that's really interesting. This isn't, it's, it's not, a, a, for that, the topic will not be one specific item, a, a piece of American history. That'll be two really exciting groups. A lot of context. One is the Brantford Electric Railroad Association. Known as the Shoreline Trolley Museum. They've been around for decades and decades. Um, and they're, they have a lot of new exciting programs. And they also have a lot of renovations. They're inviting everybody to come by and look. And the other one, I don't know if people here have even heard of it, is the Stony Creek Museum. Almost ran it. Just started up. They're really excited about it. They've got lots of great history to focus on right down there in the village of Stony Creek. So we'll have guest speakers from both. And if you sign up for membership, you'll get an invitation. To attend that. Membership is really nominal, it's $20. Don't make it sign a work party over or anything like that. Um, but we look forward to having all of you become members and attending annual meetings. Those are uh, two exciting topics. Oh, one thing if you have a cell phone, can you please put it on mute if you haven't already? Thank you very much. Uh, let's, see, let's see, the holiday party December 5th. And that's all I have to say. I want to keep my remarks brief. I'll introduce now uh, Mike Russo, our programs chair, who sets up all of these great programs for us and has everybody in. And let me just say, finally, so nice to be back out of public, even with the mask now. Yeah. All right. Thanks very much, everyone, for coming. Yeah, those are my thoughts. They were great to see it twice live in person here. And uh, we waited a long time for a uh, in person presentation. So I want to just introduce Dennis. Um, it says here, Dennis Cullen is the founder and executive director of the Witness Stones Project. He served in the Marine Corps before attending college at UMass, receiving degrees in both anthropology and economics. After a decade working for the federal government, he went on to Quinnipiac University, graduating with, with an MAT in history. While in his third decade of teaching, he started the Witness Stones Project with his students in Gilbert. To date, the project has spread to over a dozen communities in three northeastern states, reaching more than 4,000 students. And besides this project, Dennis has devoted to his wife of 43 years, his three adult children, and his grandchildren, Frankie and Joey. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to Dennis Collins. Thank you, Michael. And um, my first job out of college was at a a little factory uh, named Electric Boat. <laughs> I was uh, I worked on the, a government sized soup ship Groton, so that was my first job out of college. I was a contract negotiator there, so uh, so we we've, we've traveled the same roads at least part of our lives. Um, so I'm gonna what I'm gonna do is uh, for the uh, sake of the re re um, recording, uh, I'm gonna just present through uh, Zoom, if I can find it again. Okay, there we go. So, so um, I'm used to using a bigger screen. Let me see if I can get rid of myself <laughs> on the corner there. Okay. I'm just using a bigger screen, so I apologize. It will be uh, available online. So if you want to go home and look at a bigger version of it, please do. Um, and I, I do a lot of talking, so it, you can kind of fill in the blanks. But uh, so I was asked to talk about slavery on the shoreline um, in, in, in Connecticut. That's where we do most of our work. And we're very excited to start the project. I, so I started in 2017 after my friend Doug Nigren uh, from Guilford went to after hearing me speak at the Guilford Free Library about slavery in Guilford and Madison, he went to Germany and learned about the Stropelstein project there and came back and asked, could we remember enslaved people the way uh, Jews are remembered who, where they lived freely before they were kidnapped and murdered uh, during the Holocaust? So um, I, I always say, if you bring a sore knee to a 
uh, a, a doctor, they're going to want to operate or a surgeon. If you bring an idea to a teacher, they're going to want to make it an educational unit. So that's what is the founding of the Witness Stones project. Okay, uh, I don't know if you've seen these before, but we're going to do a land acknowledgement. So it's uh, Branford stands on Tatuket, uh, on the Tatuket band of Quinnipiac tribal land. I'd like to acknowledge our neighboring indigenous nations. Then the Hantics and Ham Manassas to the east, the Wangunks to the north, Wappinger and Pegasus to the west, and Korjog and Setucket to the south. We thank them for their strength and resilience in protecting this land and aspire to uphold our responsibility according to their example. With the work that we do, I think this, the most common question we get after someone hears is, what about the indigenous people? What about in, indigenous or Indian slavery? And we are planning on I don't just say we're planning, but we're hoping to be able to do some interpreting around that. But we go to where people ask us to go and we tell stories that people that communities ask us to tell. So as we go, especially in the eastern part of Connecticut, uh, there's a lot more stories that involve indigenous slavery. It was different. We'll talk a little bit about that later. But we know in places like Brantford and Guilford early on, especially after the Pequot Wars, and then again after the King Philip Wars, indigenous people were put in servitude and sometimes even, even traded for African slaves in the West Indies. Um, so one of the things that we're beginning to tell in history class is that, the, you know, our, and I use a little bit of my high school French, our raison d'etre, our reason to be is uh, for here has a lot to do with slavery. The places like Brantford and Guilford and, and all the towns that you see these beautiful big houses are here, not because people sold hay to each other and not even because they sold hay to New Haven. They were here because they were putting things on vessels and sending it to the West Indies. And by sending it to the West Indies, they were trading with some of the, uh, the most violent enslavers in, in, in the new world. So they were trading with sugar plantations and they were sending barrel staves and, and hoops and they were turned into barrels to put molasses and sugar in. We were sending horses, tens of thousands of horses went from Connecticut. And if you look at lists of which we'll do here soon, you'll see people filled vessels here and sent them to the West Indies and traded for the uh, products of, of the slave plantations in the West Indies. So that's a lot to do with you know, why we're here. And it's, it's important for us to, I don't know what the right word is, re-remember that. <laughs> the people here 250 years ago knew where the ships were going to and who they were trading with. But we, if you look at a lot of interpretations that we have here now, or that came in the last, it talks about the West Indies trades. We brag our ship's captains, but we don't always say what they were doing. Um, for a living. Um, we can see if we look uh, closely that we know ships left from, especially uh, Rhode Island and Mass in Connecticut and, and, um, and New York and went to Africa and purchased enslaved people, but also vessels went back and forth to the West Indies. And I would say the majority of uh, things that happened from the Connecticut shoreline was this trade back and forth to the West Indies where we sent uh, fish, livestock, flour, and lumber in trading for slaves, sugar, and molasses, and spices, and other things like that. Um, and it's, so it's important for us to realize that. It's important for us to kind of reset what we remember or how we tell our stories of, of our past. I have some specific details about uh, concerning the prevalence of West Indian trade and colonial Connecticut economy prior to the American Revolution. This is something that I... Um, I work now with Dr. Warshower up at Central Connecticut State University. And when he was giving this presentation, I said, I'm gonna steal some slides from you. So I, I redid the slides, so they're not, they're not exactly his, but this is from Dr. Eric Bartholomew, uh, 2009. And he had the Inspector General's Customs Report just for this four year period. And we can see three out of every four horses to the West Indies came from Connecticut, an average of 31 horses on each vessel. The horses were 59% of all value, valued goods. They worked in the mill, they, they ran, they you know, think of the, there was horsepower, the horses uh, were the power to run the sugar mills that squeezed the juice out of the uh, sugar cane and made, uh, the, the, and took the liquid, which was turned the molasses and sugar. 27,000 sheep during that four year period, four and a half million pounds of beef and pork. And we know beef was set on the hook and sometimes in the barrel. And you, we know that 
you know, we preserve things with salt. So we have the hams, you know, salt, pork, salted beef was, was barreled and sent to the West Indies, but also um, we see oxen and, and other uh, livestock uh, sent on the hoof. Other products, um, um, you know, 44,000 pounds of butter. Butter is a way of preserving milk, right? Butter doesn't spoil hardly, especially in the hold of a ship. Cheese, uh, you know, 12 and a half uh, thousand pounds, 77, uh, you know, almost 75,000 pounds of tallow. That's that rendered beef fat that's solid that you can make candles, you can use for lubricants and things like that. So these are things that are leaving Connecticut. We can see thousands and thousands of barrel staves, and occasionally a whole house will be taken apart and put on a ship and sent to the West Indies. So we see that type of that, uh, items going on too. What was coming in from the West Indies? One and a half million pounds of brown sugar, over a half million gallons of molasses, some rum. Some rum was made there, but a lot of rum was made in Connecticut and Newport and places here. Rum was, a, was something that was used to trade with, with, with Africa. And also you couldn't run a ship without rum. It was, it was, it was we'll say it was a lubricant for the crew instead of the ship itself. But uh, you can see on ships manifest that they always had rum, enough rum for the crew for the voyage. Um, 450,000 bushels of salt. We know Long Island Sound isn't a great place to make salt. Um, we, there were salt works we know in New Haven, I'm not sure if there were in Brantford, but uh, it takes a lot more water from Long Island Sound to make salt than it does from the West Indies. And all you need is a mouthful of water when you go out to Squamacate and realize how much salty it, saltier it is than our Long Island Sound. 47% um, of all ships that came to New Haven during that time period was, uh, came from the West Indies. 54% of all tonnage, 54% of all tonnage. So if you say, what were we doing for a living? Most of what we were doing was trading with the West Indies. New London, the numbers are similar, 30, uh, less percentage of ships because New London also had that shot. You were on, you know, you're kind of on the edge of the Atlantic Ocean. So some of those ships we know went to Europe and to the, what they call the wine islands like Medeiros and places like that. But again, 46% of all tonnage into New London came from there. And those were the two main ports in Connecticut that had a, a customs house, had customs houses. So these are, these are numbers for us to kind of think about when we think about Connecticut and what we were doing in the you know, 1700s and, and early 1800s. Um, there's some great books about this, uh, you know, the book Complicity, if you haven't read it yet, it's fantastic, it was written about 15 years ago, I think now, uh, by three uh, writers from the uh, Hartford Current, it started with an insert to the Hartford Current, and it turned into uh, this great book that only now I think we're beginning to unpack more. I use it with my uh, teacher workshops and people are like, I didn't know this stuff. It's like, well, <laughs> it's here, you know, it's, it's, it's out there. Um, I, I, I picked up this book when I was on um, the Eastern tip of Long Island, Slavery Before Race, and that's a, uh, that's a great book by Catherine um, <coughs> Hayes. She was a doctoral uh, student at UMass Boston. And she looked at both the indigenous and African enslaved people at this place called Sylvester Manor. And they did archeological digs to show that, you know, who was there, how long they were there. And Sylvester Manor was one of those places where one brother owned Shelter Island and another brother owned plantations in the West Indies. And they were, one of them was shipping lumber and, 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 and foodstuffs and things like that to the West Indies. And the other one was, shipping stuff back uh, from, from the West Indies. So you would have brothers kind of, uh, you know, kind of like multinational companies today. You might have brothers of two countries or sisters in two countries sending things to each other in those days that was happening. And there's a, a brand new book, Dark Work by Christy Clark Pajara. And she talks about um, Rhode Island. And Rhode Island isn't the same as Connecticut, but it helps you understand what slavery looked like in that part of New England, because I think, the idea of having plantations and having large workforces and almost uh, you know, single crops was happening in, in, in uh, Rhode Island. And we know if you go to Newport, Rhode Island, there's a big mansion that's kind of up on the hill. But if you go down by the water and you see these big three-story houses that look like Guilford on steroids or something like that, <clears throat> that's, those were the ship's captains who were going to Africa. So Newport, was, Newport and Bristol, Rhode Island was the center of the African trade with enslaved people. So that was coming from there. 
And so anyway, this, her book does a great job of discussing those things. And there's many more books, uh, including Disowning Slavery by Joanne Pope Mellish, which is something I always recommend for folks to read if you want to learn about New England slavery. You know, some of the things, I, I, when I got caught into this idea of looking at slavery, part of it was stumbling over the story of Harriet Beecher Stowe. So if you're from Guilford, we brag on Har Harriet lived in Guilford. Well, you know, maybe two years, but she lived in Guilford. Her mom and dad both grew up in Guilford. Uh, Lyman Beecher grew up in, in North Guilford and um, where he was fitted out for, for college for Yale. And Roxana Foote grew up in what we call Nut Plains down kind of off of exit 59. And these two uh, folks lived there. And I, I, I was really excited about the connections in Guilford. I li at the time I lived in the Nathaniel Johnson house and one of his great granddaughters married Harriet's one of Harriet's brothers, and you had the Parmalee family that was kind of related to the Foots, and so all these different connections. And one day I was looking at Harriet's biography that was written by her son, and it was kind of like an autobiography. And she talks about how she liked it at, well, she, she was really sad when their mother died because she was living in Litchfield, but they didn't, you know, dad didn't have any other wives. He had, his, he had a new wife coming, but he sent H Harriet to live with Aunt Hattie and um, Grandma Foot. And Harriet, who had been the, we'll just say the youngest who wasn't, uh, uh, who wasn't an infant, because that was uh, Henry Ward Beecher. She was the youngest in the, this big sprawling family in Litchfield. And she kind of got the last piece of bread from the bread basket. <laughs> and she got the last piece of meat. And, and she was always last. And, and she wasn't treated well. But she loved it when she went to Guilford because there were two people, uh, Harvey the Bound Boy and Black Dinah. And Aunt Hattie made sure they knew their place. So they, they had to treat her with respect because her own brothers and sisters didn't treat her with respect. And they kind of had to sit behind her and they had to be somewhat obedient to ha Harriet. And I was reading that and I'm saying, who are, who's, you know, Harvey the Bound Boy and Black Dinah? And the more I started looking and I spoke to Joel Helander, my friend and, and uh, town historian in Guilford, he said, I said, were there slaves <laughs> in Guilford? And he's like, oh yeah. They're there, you know, and that's when I started looking. I started pulling strings. Later, I found out that Uncle Justin Foote, who lived in Orange County, what is now Orange County, New York, married a Dutch woman. And when he was dying of consumption or tuberculosis, he brought two slaves with him to Guilford, and that is Harvey and, and Dinah. And those were the two people who were living in Harriet Beecher Stowe's household. No one had ever seen that. Well, they had seen it before, but they didn't they didn't make the, the connection that these might be enslaved people because Harry's story is that she first, in a sense, stumbled upon slavery when her father got the job in um, Cincinnati, uh, I think the name of the place, but there was an institute, a religious school there, and he got a job there. And she crossed the river into Kentucky and then she saw slavery there. I'm like, no, she, she was right, right off of exit 59. <laughs> you know, right off of Goose Lane is where she first, you know, was, was involved with enslaved people. And we found other enslaved people living in the neighborhood. So this idea that this New England purity, which she kind of writes about so much uh, versus, you know, what was going on in the South, it was uh, a little, little more um, muddled the story than before. And speaking of Harriet, um, her grandfather was a guy named Eli Foote. Eli Foote was a, was a lawyer. He, was, he had to kind of make a good living, but the Foots, most of the Foots were uh, Anglican Episcopalian. And who knows what side the Anglican Episcopalians were on during the American Revolution. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, they were, they were mostly loyalists. And, and, uh, so Eli was a loyalist. And uh, because of it, after the war, you know, they didn't, you know, they treated him okay, but he had to change, change jobs. So he became a, um, became a merchant. So he was filling vessels and sending them to the West Indies. And what we can see here is that, and this is, uh, he, he kind of has a consignment thing going because he's taking stuff from other people and valuing it and going to the West Indies and selling it. And they don't go to one place. They go kind of like the old Yankee traders, right? They would go and they keep going until they sell everything, then they come home. So what I've highlighted here are 700 pounds of beef and tallow, bushels of corn and oats, 4,600 red oak barrel staves, pressed hay, which 
I, you're not sure if it was for the horses and, and oxen on the vessel or if it was they were sell, bringing it there. Um, an ox and then some more culling staves. One of the things you have to remember about the West Indies, they were making so much money with sugar that they didn't grow their own crops. They were making so much money with sugar that the fish that the enslaved people ate was bacala, which is salted codfish from the George's Bank in, in Canada, you know, in, in Massachusetts. That's why there's a codfish on top of uh, Faneuil Hall. So they were eating codfish from the North Atlantic because they were making so much money making uh, sugar that it didn't make sense to apply any effort towards uh, making food items or, or anything else. So, and that was, and for New England, it was like, oh, we can fish, you know, we can, we can do that and, and make money off of it. This is a whole item just so you can see what it looks like. This was found, I found this at the uh, Harriet Beecher Stowe Center up in Hartford. They have, the Harriet Beecher Stowe Center has lots of the Guilford foot stuff. Now we know there's Brantford foots and then we'll see a few of them here later, but the Guilford foots, including um, Eli foot and his, um, his daughter Roxana foot and her um, youngest brother, George Augustus foot, that was a family that, that lots of things happened in and around, including uh, Hattie Ward Foot Holly uh, married uh, Fighting Joe Holly, who was a general in the American I mean, the American Civil War, and sh they were abolitionists. And so you have this interesting and amazing family. <laughs> but that's that was again um, Harriet's mother's side. And these are just, and you can see this when you go. But these are just um, the list. So I transcribed it all. And just so you can see a few of them, you know, Simeon Chittenden's, it says, um, you know, so it'll be Simeon Chittenden's oxen, Thomas Griswold's oxen, Jabez Benton's ox, deducting hide and tallow, I don't know what that means, oats, and sometimes they have barrels of, of you know, bushel of beans, a bushel of oats. Uh, and this, this is some of the stuff, <laughs> you know, this is, this is uh, rum for the, for, the, for the sailors and rum for the guys filling the vessel for the, you know, for the guys working on the vessel. But these are the types of things you see. And if you, if you do look at these documents, the first column is, is pounds and then it's shilling and pence. So that's the way it goes across later on. So that's still happening in 1790. They're not using dollars as a currency yet, but soon after they start using dollars as a currency. So we can see he fills the vessel in, um, on consignment. And I think his job in life, his goal in life is to sell things for more than what he's paying the consignment folks for. So, uh, so he's, he's going to get the profit on the uh, higher, higher side of that. And also take that great risk because it's a big risk to send the vessel down. They usually only would take two trips a year starting in March because they want to get, <clears throat> wanted to get back before the uh, hurricane season. So how do we, you know, so that I just, so getting off of that, but how do we remember the formerly enslaved here? You know, in, in Guilford, we have we just recently found the second grave marker for a, a, a man named Shem in, in North Guilford. In Guilford itself, the downtown uh, graveyard was moved. So they took the stones from the green. There was, the green was where the graveyard was. They took the stones from the green and some of them are on Boston Street out towards um, um, Madison and some of them are over kind of behind the Dunkin' Donuts in the graveyard back there on, on Route 1. But most of the, I'd say many of the graveyards didn't make it, but North Guilford, the graveyard, still has uh, French Indian War soldiers there and other things like that. So it's pretty uh, extensive. But there is one gravestone. I, I, I was working with folks in uh, Greenwich, and we see a gravestone for Candace and um, Candace Bush and, and Hester Mead. They were both enslaved by David Bush, who owned what's now the Bush Holly House. Um, but oftentimes we, you know, for all the hundreds and hundreds of enslaved people who lived uh, on the shoreline here, there's very few uh, markers or remembrance of where they were. Um, in Guilford, the street kind of behind um, CBS you, on some old maps was called N-Word Lane. And, um, and recently someone noticed it and the library was send it, selling the maps and they were like, oh, let's, <laughs> let's wipe that out before we continue selling it. And they, they changed it to North Street. Um, the only thing I don't like about it is we no longer remember African Americans lived there. So if we, if you go to Guilford, there's not an African American, there's African Americans living in Guilford, but there's not a, a neighborhood or, or a place like that. So 
by renaming things, sometimes we forget. It, it's almost by trying to do something good by giving it a better name, we take away uh, why, why it's named after a certain ethnic group. In Milford, they had a pond named Nick's Pond and they changed it to Walker Pond. That's the name of the first uh, African-American minister of the Baptist church in Milford. So that's kind of a neat thing. And you guys here in Brantford, you had, uh, maybe had a different name, but you had these rocks off the coast on the uh, maritime maps and they just recently changed it to Soweek Rock the name after the, um, I think the local sachem who was uh, in Brantford. So, so you can see, we, we try to remember, but it's still hard to, you know, balance the remembering with, without being, you know, uh, rude or, or inappropriate. Um, other less obvious places we find things, um, you know, we, we have different documents, uh, you know, and I'll show you something that I found here the library here, which is wonderful, but people are doing work. So in 1933 um, or 1937, uh, Mary Holy Griswold, so she probably was related to Brantford people too, if she's a holy, uh, she wrote a, stories about different houses and different people in Guilford, and she included the stories of enslaved people, which was probably, you know, it's kind of spectacular. So that's a, that's a pretty neat book. Uh, Harry Beach's father, his autobiography, which he often, um, was question and answer with the kids. And he also includes letters. He talks about slavery in North Guilford. He talks about enslaved people. He even talks about Moses, who was a king of the local enslaved people. So that's a great piece of information, although we don't, we read across the grain when he says, oh, slavery was lenient or easy in Guilford. Well, it was easy. For, <laughs> it was easy for him. You know, it's, I don't think it's easy for, for a mother whose child is sold from him. I don't think it's easy. Um, for people who are separated, I don't think it's easy when 20% of the people who were brought to the new world died on the way here. So it's never, you know, as uh, Dr. Hassan Kwame Jeffrey says, there's no good slavery, it's worse or worse. Or worse. And there's no good in slavery, it's, you know, bad or, or worse. Uh, so other places we find um, uh, in, Bre in, uh, in Greenwich, a, a Jeffrey Mead, he, uh, he went and scoured all the uh, property records and took out, and he found all the emancipations in the property records in the Greenwich uh, town records, and he put it together in a book. And it's a great source. I've used it with the students in Greenwich, and, and I've done something similar for Guilford. I know at one time I tried to do that in Brantford, and I couldn't find it, and I'm not sure if it was a habit. You know, people in some towns, one of the reasons you would put an emancipation in the property records because you are transferring the ownership of something to somebody else. Oftentimes the ownership of call to himself. But if it's done after 1792, then there are conditions which if you freed someone under these certain conditions, then you're not responsible for them in your old age. So people would you know, make sure the town clerk put it in the record so they don't have to pay if the, if the person ended up in the almshouse. So we find that, <clears throat> we find, um, See, this, this is always tricky for me, but we're gonna give it a try. Um, so this is an example of, let me make it bigger. This is from David Bush, who was the owner of the Bush Holly House. And his, um, after he died, he had a, a probate inventory, which happens a lot. And in the inventory, um, you can see here between the hands, and cheeks and dried beef, he has patients worth, worth $7, Phyllis worth $50, and a Negro man named Cull worth $125. And then next you see listed animals and livestock. So if you didn't think that the enslaved people were part of the property, um, then, then here it is. You know, that's, and, that, and this is something when the kids see it, that kind of hits them, they knocks them back on their heels. It's like, why would you list a human being next to the oxen. Well, that's oftentimes where humans are listed if they're enslaved. And if you wondered what this guy was doing for a living, notice um, right here, he has a swoop. And so, and if you go to the Bush Holly house, it is right under Route 95, right where um, Costco, right where the, where the, where the, uh, the bay is, or right, right where the coal is. So he was filling the vessel, he was a miller, he had lots of different things. And they've been telling the story about how David Bush was this great entrepreneur and how he was able to accumulate wealth 
which was true, but now we're realizing he had 15 enslaved people that were helping him along the way or making sure that he accumulated wealth. So he did accumulate wealth by exporting people and they're beginning to tell a different story now. We have, um, we have three in, uh, Witness Stones Memorial now placed at the uh, Bush Hawley House and they're beginning to change our interpretation, which is wonderful for us because that's what we're looking for. We're not looking to tear down the Bush Hawley House, we're looking to tell a different story. Okay. Um, other places you find records, well, here is, um, on the left side is the East Haven Congregational Church. East Haven in, the, in those days also included Morris Cove and uh, parts of Fairhaven and stuff like that. So it was, it was a bigger town back, back uh, before 1880. But I have a little cheat. If you go to the church records, this is the church record index that you can find at the state library and also on Ancestry. If you cheat, you can go to the back and where it says no surnames, people without last names, you find lists many times of people who were enslaved. So we have here, you know, Pink married Stepna, and it says servants of Captain Morris and Isaac Forbes. You know, if you go down there, you have Morris Cole, Forbes Avenue, and you start looking at the names, you're like, oh, these are Hemingway. These are all the names of the streets in, in East Haven. And that's not a coincidence. You see Stephen and John, um, or um, Rose Negro, her child died 1783, about five years old. Another child of hers uh, died about two years old. Uh, Sybil married Cork, servants of Jahil uh, Forbes. And this is alphabetical, so there's pages, this is probably about four or five pages of enslaved people just in East Haven that we can uh, list here. And sometimes we have enslaved people listed, but they don't even give their names. It's like a Negro girl of Jaden Chitsey, a Negro woman of Lieutenant Bradley, uh, a Negro girl of Deacon Smith. Well, if you know who Deacon Smith is, you probably know the name of his servants or enslaved people. So part of it is we see that, the, that they, it's not always something that um, people took the time to do. And over on the right here, sometimes, especially in Greenwich, I find the enslaved people took on the last names of the enslavers. So if, you look on, if you're looking for enslaved people owned by David Bush, look under Bush. And you see Cull Jr., um, Millie Patience, Lucy, Nancy, um, Hester and Candace. So these are all names of enslaved people who were owned by the Bush family. And when they gained their freedom, in most cases, they took on the Bush name, although Hester took on the Mead name and Mead is another big name in, um, in, in Greenwich. Um, I think it was the name of the guy who put together that book. <laughs> but it also, um, but we're not sure why she took on that last name, but it might have been, there might have been a reason for it at the time. She went from place to place, and one of the schools that did the, her story, uh, Greenwich Academy, the founder of Greenwich Academy took on Hester as a servant after she was freed. So, she, so it was interesting for the students to look at her life and, and where she was. And there's even an extant painting that Hester made that hangs at Greenwich Academy. So it's a kind of a neat thing that kids could feel and see the relationship by where they go to school. <clears throat> we have other records, of course. Um, this is the 1774 colonial census. We can see if you subtract out, uh, the top one is Brantford. If you subtract out the uh, four indigenous people, and I think I did the math wrong, is the 99 Africans or people of African descent or black, what they call black people. Blacks in 1774 in Brantford, that includes North Brantford. Um, we believe the majority in 1774 of these people were enslaved. So there was about a hundred enslaved people. You take a snapshot of Brantford in 1774, you find about a hundred enslaved people. You see the other communities, uh, Guilford, which was Guilford and Madison, had says 84 here, but Guilford for some reason had a larger group of indigenous people. They believe around the West Lake area, you know, right on the Guilford, North Brantford, Brantford border, West Lake, that there was a, uh, um, a mixed tribal village there around this time period of, of uh, Mohegans and Antics and Quinnipiacs. Um, Wallingford is large, but Wallingford included Cheshire and parts of Meriden today. Of course, New Haven. If you look who's missing, New Haven, East Haven, and West Haven, 
and parts of Camden, you see 273 with only uh, that number, only 11 people, right? Only 11 were indigenous. So you can see the numbers. So in New Haven County at the time, which included Durham, there was about a thousand or 900 uh, people of African descent. We believe the majority of them were enslaved. The number held at about 3% of a population. And 3% sounds like a little amount, but that's kind of um, one in 30. So if I go to Guilford Public Schools today or Madison Public Schools today, there is not one in 30 African-Americans. You might have, when I taught for over 20 years, I probably taught more kids whose parents were West Indian or African than I taught African-American kids. So you can see the numbers don't make sense today. Um, we'll continue. And this is, this is in 1782, and I went and um, went through the numbers for 1782. And if you look there, you can see um, it's, by, it's by county. At the time, New London County by far was the largest county of enslaved people. And, and I, I'm finding towns that I'm kind of, I don't know what the right word, surprised at. It's like Lebanon and Colchester and places like up and out of, of away from water and away from the coast are these towns that had these larger plantations. Salem had, I think the largest plantation, Salem, Connecticut, which is kind of north of Lyme uh, in Connecticut. So there's places because of the type of work that was being done, probably more like Rhode Island, you had these, you had more larger groups of enslaved people. Here, when we started seeing in the census data uh, in, in 1790, our census, allows us to see what households enslaved people are in. In most cases here and, and throughout New England, except for these pockets in Southern Rhode Island, um, oftentimes it's one or two enslaved people in a household. So you don't, you don't, occasionally you see families and oftentimes they're associated with like ministers and people who just kept families. And one of the things we talk about is say, well, slavery was not as bad in the South, but here, enslaved people were separated from potential mates and potential partners. They were separated here and they were living in Puritan households. So, so that's even, you know, that's, if that's not worse there. But um, so you see that happening here. And we also see, and, I, and I'm, not a, I'm not a demographer, but you can see like the fertility rate here seems to be very low among people of color. So as the population in Guilford and Madison doubled from 1790 to 1850, the black native population shrunk in half. And that's not even biology. That's some, there's something else going on. Um, so these are the names, you know, I, I found this was from the, that, um, Hard for current, but it's also, you can find it if you scrape the uh, census. These are the names of the enslavers in 1790 in Brantford. We know some of them are North Brantford. We, we, we know that, but I, I don't know. Maybe one of you knows kind of in your head where the, <laughs> where the census splits. But, um, you know, if I just look at some of the names that I recognize, like uh, uh, Barker, Atwater, um, Russell, Samuel Russell is probably related to the Samuel Russell who helped found um, Yale University. Uh, Beach is a certainly a big name. Holdley, Rose, we still have Rose Farms and uh, Page and Rogers, the Rogers House. Is, a, is there more than one of those? Uh, I know there's one in uh, Stony Creek. Um, and Noyce and Fowler um, and Guilford, the Fowler family. And, and you might know Lin Lindsley and some others that you might know. But these are folks, um, you know, we have a similar list in Guilford and many of the other towns. Usually the most affluent people, oftentimes the ministers. And, you know, I, I would say that the ministers, if they're tending to their human flock, they needed somebody else to tend to their their real flock, their real, their, their farm. Uh, ships captains, if they were away, uh, they needed someone to do the work. There wasn't a lot, we don't have a lot of records of indentured servants and those types of people um, here. So it was all oftentimes family and if you could afford it, you'd hire an enslaved or you'd take on an enslaved person. 
This is, this is just straight out of the census. This is what the census looks like if you go on Ancestry. There's probably a copy of the census here at the library that's printed out. But if you go there, this is the last page for, for Brantford. We could see in 1790, there were 54 enslaved people and 36 free blacks. If you add those two numbers up together, you come very close to the 1774 number, don't you? So if this, I, that brings us to 90. Right. And that brings us to 90 and there was 100 people of color. Uh, so we, we have 90 people and we see these numbers start to flip. So the 1790 census after the American Revolution, we know there was a bunch of men who were freed um, to fight in the revolution. There was a, a state law that allowed someone to free their enslaved person so they could in a sense, take their place and fight in the war. And then we see, um, and then 1792, after the census, the law that says if an enslaved person is between 25 and 45, and they pass a, <laughs> a physical, and they want to be freed, the enslaver can free them and not be responsible for them in their old age. Now, you know, we say today, like, you know, 60 is a new 50 or 70 is a new 60. Well, I think in those days, 45 was the new 65. So was the old 65. So somebody who's been working really, really, really hard till they're 45, getting freed with nothing except the clothes on their back wasn't necessarily the biggest gift you could give somebody. But we know some enslaved people took great advantage of that when they gained their freedom and did some wonderful things. But we have to realize, and, and it happens even today where undocumented folks, you know, work as gardeners and and maids and nannies and stuff like that. And then when they get older, they're released and they don't, you know, they're not uh, eligible for social security. So it isn't like today we're good and, and the people in the, in the old days were bad. It's just, there was a tendency in the state of Connecticut and the local towns were so, um, they, they were tight with their money. So they wanted to make sure that somebody was responsible for that person. Um, so that's why you couldn't just free somebody and you couldn't free your 65 year old enslaved person you could free them, but then you had to oftentimes put something like a bond out there to make sure that they were taken care of in their old age. But freeing somebody is in a sense, taking away the place where they live, taking their job away. Um, and in a community where free, being free and black wasn't necessarily uh, uh, an advantageous thing to do. Because as we see in the censuses, as the African-American population shrinks, I've had people argue with me, it's because there were no jobs here. Well, guess what's happening? Irish people are coming to take those jobs. So in, in many ways, it was probably cheaper to hire an Irishman as a day laborer or a gig employee than it was to keep an enslaved person for 12 months a year. So, so there was an economic piece to it, but there wasn't, there didn't seem to be a lot of heart associated with the, with the decisions that were being made. This is some stuff specific to Brantford. Uh, Jane Peterson Bowley, is she here? She's not here today. But she, you know, she's a town historian, she's done a fantastic work up, I think upstairs or wherever the local history stuff is. There's this book filled with facts about enslaved people that she did in 2000, she finished in 2018. It's more of a, a folder, I'm not a folder, but it's, but it's fantastic. It's filled with information. If anyone wants to further research enslaved people in Brantford, you have all, she gives you a, a running head start. Um, this is a photograph taken in 1998, supposedly of uh, a slave. Now, the question is, how could you have a picture of an enslaved person in, in, in 1898? And I, I did the math one time and I figured it out, but the, the rule was in Connecticut, and it also de depends how you define an enslaved person. The rule was in Connecticut after March of 1784, if you were born to an enslaved woman, you only remain enslaved until you were 25 years old. And that later on became 21 years old. So there was a rule saying, but if, if you do, if you kind of do the math and you take a child born in 1783, 1783, who was able to have a child in the 1820s, um, and that person could be enslaved for the first two decades of our life. So this woman may not have been a slave for life, but she may, uh, she may have been enslaved at some part of her life. And some people say that, well, that's a bound person. That person's not a slave, but if you can buy and sell somebody in my book, you're kind of a slave. So that's, this was an enslaved person. And 
it, I think it's a great picture. It shows a uh, woman with character, uh, maybe wearing, you know, um, many layers of clothing and it, it isn't, you know, and I, again, I, I'm not going to vouch for it. I did. I just found it in, in, uh, in Jane's book <laughs> and another book in French. I think it was the, uh, the little, like, short line book that came out in 1976. Uh, but these, these are some examples. So she had, this is the, this is the page of C. So you have Candace, Caroline, Casper, Kate, 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 Catherine, Kathy, Cato, Caesar, Champy, and Child. Um, this is from the 1800 census, just to show you what's going on. Down here, we have Isaac Foote. Um, and he has two enslaved people right here. It's the far right column. Over here, we have Gaskill Wood Woodward, and he has one enslaved person in his household. But what I liked on this one, because this, this page is Bradford, but I think I, I, I bet you that it's North Bradford, is we have Gad Asher. In Gad Asher, we have his story. Uh, Reverend Jeremiah Asher, Gad Asher wrote his own kind of story. And in it, he wrote the story of his father from when he was captured in Africa to when he was brought and bought off of a vessel in Guilford and fought the American Revolution for his enslaver, who was either Linus or Titus Bishop, with the promise of his freedom when he returned. Gad Asher returned, Mr. Bishop said. Well, I'm going to give you your freedom, but now you have to pay me what I paid you 35 years ago. And Gad Asher was double confused because he was married to a free woman, but he thought his children were enslaved. So he wanted to get his freedom to free his children. Well, the way the rules were, which I think was the Virginia rule that we applied up here, that the children's status went with the mother. So if the mother was free, even no matter what the status of the father, so he ended up paying for his freedom and then moving his family to North Brantford. Jeremiah, his grandson, was very bright, ended up becoming a, uh, a Presbyterian minister, wrote this autobiography, and then he ended up, and I think he was born in North Brantford, he was the first um, African-American chaplain to die in service to his country. So that's Jeremiah Asher from like here, from Right around here. So, and, and that's, to me, that's like a pretty amazing story that the grandson of enslaved people uh, died in service to his country in the American Civil War. And that's, uh, and these are the stories we want to have the kids tell, but we want to tell and, and retell. There's a grandson of enslaved people in Guilford who died in Africa looking for homes for freed slaves in January 1861. He died in Africa looking for homes for freed slaves. It's like, that's another minister who came from nothing and ended up becoming a minister and then um, running a church in, 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 uh, in New Jersey. If you look at his, his name is Elemus Rogers and his story is, is amazing too. So we have these stories that are kind of sitting here waiting to be told. And, and my goal is to do it with the kids, <laughs> you know, have the kids tell the stories, And that, that's really effective. There's some other places to find information. This is the Book of Negroes. So the Book of Negroes is, is a, if, you're, if you're Canadian, you might've heard of this before, but at the end of the American Revolution, Sir Guy Carleton, you can see his name there. Um, he put a vessels together and shipped up African-Americans who fought on the British side, runaway blacks who ran to the British, uh, other free blacks, and sometimes even enslaved people. And he brought them to Canada because the British promised the American African-Americans that if you leave slavery, if you leave the Americans and come to us, we'll give you your freedom. Now, we, we, we tend to celebrate African-Americans who fought on the side of the American, American side of the American Revolution. But if you're thinking about human beings, well, these guys fighting on the British side are pretty cool too, because they fought for their freedom, didn't they? So, um, so we see these ships and, and in it, we can see these, these long lists of African-Americans who came from the 13 colonies in, in the United States and were brought to Canada. And many of who still, you know, their descendants still live there today. So it's, it's just another side piece, but the closest I could find to here is, is New Haven and, and Killingsworth or Killingworth, they put an S in there. Um, but it is, there is, it's a great source of information. You know, so if slavery was critical to the development of our country, and if slavery shaped the beliefs about race in our country, if slavery was the main cause of the Civil War, and if the enslaved, enslaved resisted their bonds and still contributed to the growth of our country, how can we remember 
and restore the history of the enslaved. So that's, that's kind of like our critical question for the Witness Stones Project. If, if these are all true, um, then, then what, you know, how can we do what we need to do? And again, we were inspired by the Stolperstein Project. This is a, a Stolperstein right here. And it, in, for those of you who can read German, which I can't, but sometimes German looks close, but it says Max Schwerner, um, born in 1877, deported in 1942 to Terenstadt, which was a, and then in 1944, he went to Auschwitz where he was murdered. So that's, that's what that stone says. And in, that was our inspiration. There are 70,000 of these stones in, in Central Europe, across Europe, uh, many, many in Germany, uh, where it started in Berlin. But our job is, our project is to inspire, if we're inspired by the Stolperstein project, we research enslavement, engage the citizenry, and, and educate the students. So, um, so that's what we were aiming to do. And um, we, <clears throat> so this is our mission statement, which is very similar to we research education, civic engagement, witness on project seeks to restore the history and honor the humanity of enslaved individuals who helped build our communities. So it's, um, you know, it's, it's a simple uh, mission statement. And for me, it keeps us on track. You know, if you, you have the Guilford Historical, I mean, the Brantford Historical Society has a mission statement, but the mission statement has to keep you on track. What are you doing? What am I doing today? What am I doing today to further the mission? What am I, what should I not be doing to further the mission? So I just had a, a reporter, you know, email me and said, oh, we want to do an article about X and, and Y and Z. And I'm like, you know, here's, an, here's somebody else to speak with because that's not what that's not what we're aiming to do. You know, we're aiming to do something else. If you if you're looking to see about politics, we're not. You know, we're not doing politics. This is what we're doing because if we get too deep in politics, then we're not going to be welcome in the schools. That's our, our so our goal is to do what we're doing and do it well and to be welcomed by everybody. We want everybody to uh, want to be interested in what we're doing. Um, so when I when my friend told me about the Stro uh, Stroposheim project and I and, and I had to figure out how to bring because I had lots and lots and lots of research. And how do I bring it to the students? And what happened is I, you know, I probably had about 10 years of research. So I looked at it one more time with the idea of memorializing enslaved people. And I came up with these five themes. Um, the themes are dehumanization or enslaved property, the treatment of enslaved, which is kind of a subset of dehumanization, but we keep telling the myth that slavery was okay here. It wasn't bad. So we have to kind of change that. Paternalism, and that paternalism is something kids completely understand, but indigenous people understand, and African Americans understand. It's like, you know, we'll vote for you, we'll we'll do this for you. You don't, you know, we'll take care of you, or we'll make decisions for you because we think what we think we know what's best for you. Well, imagine that if you're an adult and someone's making decisions for you. That's that's the tough thing. So we see paternalism throughout enslavement and even for free blacks in Connecticut. After the majority of African Americans were free in 1818, we took away their right to vote. And they didn't get it back until the 15th Amendment. They didn't get it back. They got it back the same year that the African Americans in Alabama got it back. So that's what, that's what happened in Connecticut. Because, you know, why do they need to vote? We can, we, we, we can take care of that for them. Um, economics of slavery, if you ever studied economics, it ruins any other thing you're doing because it becomes about the numbers. And when you start looking at the numbers, you realize so many decisions. When am I going to free that enslaved person? Not when my heart tells me to, but when my pocketbook does. And that's what we see throughout. And then the most important, which was shared to me by Marcus Shapiro from the anti defamation League, is agency and resistance. If we keep telling the stories of victimization, then we're, in a sense, re-victimizing the enslaved people we're telling the stories of. But what we do is look at these documents and we extract out where the enslaved person is no longer involved with paternalism, but they're making their own decisions and they're getting their freedom. And we try not to be judgmental. If you get your freedom for doing everything you're supposed to do and being loyal, then God bless you. If you get your freedom by running away, God bless you. If you get your freedom by poisoning your <laughs> enslaver, God bless you. So, we, you know, it's, it's, it's just like, if you get your freedom by fighting on the side of the Americans, that's agency. If you get your freedom by fighting on the side of the British, that's agency and resistance. Those are all ways that we can identify and help the students identify and play people not as an object, but as somebody that has similar thoughts and feelings and desires that they have. So this is how we do it. 
And if you're a teacher, you know what a jigsaw activity is, but we have the kids look at, a group of kids will look at dehumanization, another group will look at paternalism, another group will look at human agency and resistance, using primary documents, share them back with each other, so then at the end of this first unit, the kids see the big picture. They see what slavery looked like by looking at all these pieces. So that's that's our curriculum, and that's what we bring. We, we work with fifth grade and 12th grade students now. Uh, Kind of our sweet spot to middle school, but we can we can adjust. Upper middle school, I should say. Um, you know, these are some of the documents in in um, Suffield. We did the story of uh, Tamar, and she was bought and sold a few times. She ended up getting her freedom by marrying Venture Smith's son. So Venture Smith is probably the most famous enslaved person in Connecticut. And his narrative is one of the things that I use to tell kids slavery might have been gentle, but this is what Venture Smith says. He was hogtied and beat. And this is what happened to his wife. And this is how many times he was double crossed. But anyway, so <laughs> the funny thing with Tamar is that we, we, we kind of, and, this, and we ended up having to redo her, her stone because we couldn't, she disappeared in 1810. So we thought she died then. Well, somebody else continued doing research because she lived in Suffield and she lived in East Haddam and then they found her in, in Middletown. And we found her because her husband Solomon who married her and gave her freedom, wrote a runaway notice for his wife. Not because she was enslaved, but because she was a wife and she ran away from him. So she wrote a, uh, she, he wrote a runaway notice. So at the end I said, well, she showed her agency twice, once getting married and once running away from her husband. And it's a, it's a great story. And, and now we have the date changed because we found other records, I think 1817 or something like that. But, but these are the things that we, we try to do is, and it's hard because the folks in the past who wanted to somewhat make excuses for themselves old, holding people in slavery, don't always want to show you the the positive side of enslaved per persons. They don't want to show their agency. They don't want to show their abilities. They want to sometimes make them look foolish or like make them like, I had to do this because of the way they acted. And so it's almost like, I, I, you know, a, a relationship today, if you, if you ask an abuser, why, you know, why did you, you know, why did you do this? Well, they weren't submissive enough or they talked back to me or whatever it happened to be. And you sit there and say, gee, that's, for a person in power to say that is very different than looking at it from the person who wasn't in power. So as told by white owners, uh, slavery was lenient with many freedoms, paternalistic with masters guiding the morals of slaves, treatment as part of the family, care for life. According to slave narratives by Venture Smith, James Morris and Jeffrey Brace and the story of Gad Asher by his grandson, whippings and beatings and hog tyings, double crossings and cheatings, abandonment of the aged and youth sold south, severe punishments for minor crimes. Some of the things that we're looking at today with how people are treated and you're saying, why does someone die because they got stopped because they have a, a tail out or something like that. But it's, you're seeing that thing, it starts. It starts in the 1720s and 1730s. It starts here where someone out of line, you know, that past curfew, that severe punishments for things like being past curfew for a person of color, is, is makes you begin to believe that our system might have been created to treat people differently and, or maybe even more clearly. Um, you know, what is human agency? Human agency is how one displays desire to take control of their lives. Agency can come in the form of resistance. It can also be demonstrated through one's capacity to control their own circumstances. When I started using agency, people said, where did you get that word? I think it's from like, sociology or psychology where, you know, if someone, you know, if they're going to commit someone to the insane asylum, do they have agency? Can they make their own decisions? But we can see this middle piece is somebody who was a runaway ad uh, for, for Fairfield. So we can see uh, there's hundreds of runaway ads throughout New England. Um, we like runaway ads because sometimes they're the only place we know what people look like because they'll talk about what scars or tattoos or if they have a broken finger or how tall they are, how much they weighed. So these runaway ads are useful for us to begin to imagine what enslaved people look like. So examples of agency through resistance include refusing to work, sabotaging work, running away. Other forms of agency could be working hard or earning enough money to pay, your own, pay for your own freedom, gaining or purchasing one's freedom, having children, 
and sometimes even surviving uh, captivity. And, and, and uh, especially in some of the plantations in Mississippi, people will say, you know, God bless my ancestors because they survived because I'm here today because somebody, you know, survived. Um, and this is showing agency through past and present successes, just like my grandparents who didn't have an eighth grade education were happy when many of their grandchildren went to college. Uh, we have the story in Guilford, we have this great story because we have now 11 generations of the story of Pat Wilson Phineas, who's on the right here. It's really, she's a ninth generation, but she has grandkids. And her story is related to Moses, who was told to us by uh, <coughs> Lyman Beecher. And we've been able to trace the uh, purchase of Montrose and Phyllis in Boston in 1727, all the way to present day. Uh, Pat Wilson Phineas's dad was a Tuskegee Airman. Her granddad uh, went to college at the Hampton Institute. Uh, there's a a king of slaves in her family. There is Elemis Rogers who died in Africa as part of her family. There was a famous <laughs> weather prophet in Guilford in the 1880s who was part of her family that people like, he, I, I don't know if he had a barometer in his, in his brain or something, but he could tell when storms were coming. And it's, it's kind of well documented. But what we have this great family and she has been the uh, state representative from Ashford, Connecticut. She was a commissioner of social services and now she's the board chair of the Witness Stones Project. So we're excited because we're telling her story. We're telling her family story and we continually invite her in to say, what do you think? Or am I saying this wrong or something? And she doesn't, always, she doesn't think she knows everything but she, she can tell you when she feel something like Moses, it said that he remained a slave because he was king. So he was a local king of the slaves, which is a kind of a Southern New England thing. And, um, and what that kind of meant to me was he was, you know, the old saying, rather be a big fish in a small pond. So getting his freedom didn't necessarily get him benefit because he was kind of running the show. Uh, he was a factotum. He sent his enslaver's son to Yale. He paid for, uh, <laughs> Amos Fowler's son, Johnny, to go to Yale. So this guy was pretty amazing as an enslaved person. And Pat initially said kind of, no, if he could have got his, if he could afford to pay for his master's son to go to Yale, he could have afforded to get his, he could have paid for his own freedom. But, you know, but after a while, she kind of said, well, yeah, but what was freedom to Moses? What was freedom to Moses in Guilford and things like that? But anyway, it's, but I go to her and say, is this something I should say? So now when I say, tell the story, I say, well, this is what I think. I think he, he liked what he was doing and almost maybe a little Stockholm syndrome. But on the flip side, she, I said, but, but Pat doesn't agree with me. <laughs> so it, it's good for both of our points of view to get across. Um, so what do I do for a living? Um, I do teacher, you know, on a good day, I'm doing teacher workshops. I'm, I'm, we're in all across the state of Connecticut, also in New Jersey and working with historic Deerfield. And we, we do the research for, individual communities. So if I were to come to uh, Brantford, I would take materials and analyze them and process them to make them accessible to kids in Brantford. If I'm in Killingly, I'm doing it there. If I'm in Greenwich, I'm doing the stories there. I partner with historical organizations, house museums, um, all across the state. Uh, churches, the congregational churches especially, um, right now are pushing, although the Episcopal, Episcopal churches are also pushing to look at their using the other word, complicity towards slavery. How were they involved in the past? What can they do today to redress some of those issues? So we, we go from town to town. This is the stone on the bottom here was in, is in front of St. George Church, not because the Catholics at that church were. We know the Jesuits were at Georgetown, but, uh, but two houses before St. George's was where um, Thomas Pynchon lived and he held Joaquin there in captivity, although Joaquin was brought to Guilford by a Nicholas Loisel, who was a West Indies French refugee, was running away from the slave uprisings in Guadeloupe. So he brought two of his enslaved people to Guilford, and Joaquin was one of them. So it's really interesting. And, and the part of the records we found that the, the French consulate records that were transcribed into the New London property records. So it's so you these pieces are all here, and, and the pieces, and I'm finding that enslaved people. And free blacks, I, I kept thinking they were like, in, it's like I'm looking for them in one place, but just like everyone else, 
they moved around. So you hear stories of enslaved people from Connecticut uh, getting their freedom and moving to Vermont or people from Connecticut moving with their enslaved people. So all of a sudden there's this Vermont, Connecticut connection for African-Americans that we're trying to put together. You know, with historical organizations, we're using that sense of place. Putting a stone where somebody lived, worked, or prayed is very, very powerful. It's not, slavery wasn't somewhere else that happened to someone else. This is slavery here happened to this person right here. The Moses stone is in front of the town hall because that's where Reverend Amy's father lived. So it's, you're, when you're standing outside the town hall, you're standing outside the, build, outside the place where Moses was held in captivity. That is much more powerful than reading about it in the book. <clears throat> you know, where are we at now? This is our updated map of Connecticut, and we probably have about three or four more places to fill in uh, within the next week. Uh, but we're, we, we've been doing a lot of work east of the Connecticut River recently. We just got... Uh, a new project in Essex Deep River in Chester. Of course, we're in Lyme and Old Lyme. Here, it's it's kind of the NFA, Norwich Free Academy, takes a lot of towns. So some of these are like regional schools, but we're working at with Salisbury School and we place uh, the independent school there. We place a stone in, in Norfolk, Connecticut. Um, we just got a contract with a school in Danbury. Uh, we're with two independent schools in New Haven but we're working with the Wallingford Historic Preservation Office to do a project with the Historic Society and then move it into the schools next. So, so we have a lot of places. We probably have been in more, I, in, before we said 20 communities and, and we had just updated it today and we're, we're closer to 30 communities now and, and 7,000 kids. But what we're um, looking to do is, is really try to make our curriculum accessible to everyone. Um, and right now we have to chart. We survive off of fees and service, but we're going to be talking to the state department of education that if we're already in 20% of the communities, why maybe we're kind of like an NGO now and we're doing government's work for them and maybe they can help support what we're doing. We can find a way to make it very, the jigsaw activity, very affordable for all Connecticut students. But the other part is just too much work. We can't give the putting a stone in the ground, the research required for each town. We can't give that away yet, but if you know we get good funding, we can. Uh, but because our goal isn't to make money, our goal is to reach more, reach more students and adults. And and I say students, but if you reach 200 students and you're reaching 400 adults and and aunts and uncles, and it really has a positive thing. Um, and this is a stone for the tooth that was put in um, in Brantford two years ago. Um, and I was arguing with the kids, so it says it's hard to see with this thing here, but it says. Latus, mother and weaver, enslaved here, emancipated, she was emancipated twice, which is a Connecticut thing, because she was emancipated before the law came out in 1792, which would have indemnified her enslavers from being responsible for her in her old age. So they freed her a second time so they didn't have to make it do the Pontius Pilate thing, wash their hands. But the kids were doing this, the kids were deciding what they wanted on the stone. So we have our criteria, but we keep her open. And I said, well, we know she inherited from Reverend Jonathan Todd uh, spinning, spinning wheels in a loop. So we could put, you know, spinner and weaver. And they said, well, we want to put mother on it. I said, father is, is mother, but we want to put like her occupation. And I said, how about, you know, weaver and mother? And they said, how about mother and weaver? <laughs> and then I realized I had to shut up at that point because the kids have completely humanized her now. They were thinking of Latouche like they were thinking of Mother. And you know, I, I, I got a home run and I was arguing with the ref, you know, <laughs> arguing with the umpire. You know, I, I hit it out of the park and I'm arguing with them that these kids now have humanized her so much that I couldn't, you know, I was like, oh, I, I just need to stop talking now. But that's an example of how it can happen. You can see, you know, students become consumers and producers of lit uh, information literacy. They collaborate, communicate, you know, they, they present their findings to authentically to, uh, to the public. Um, and then they build the foundation to discuss hard history and the, class, the path towards truth and reconciliation. So we need to, you know, we, we need to begin that foundation. We don't, you know, we, we don't have to do everything in eighth grade or seventh grade, but we can tell a different story than we were told, or we can have the kids tell the story themselves because if they're holding the documents in their hand or on their laptop, 
then there's not a question in their mind what happened in the past. It's not, they don't have to overly interpret anything. It's, it's right there. So what they're doing is filling in information, but it's information that helps them, you know, uh, understand our, our country's history. And it's something, you know, I grew up in Massachusetts and I love Massachusetts and all the stories that went there. And I remember walking on the trails of the, what the Nipmunk Indians and the Bay Path up there was where the path the Nipmunks took from like Albany to, to Boston and all these things. And I never knew anything about African-Americans in that community. And this project is allowing kids here to begin to re-envision the past. Imagine they close their eyes and they think of Colonial Brantford and it's a much more colorful place than we've been sharing with them. And it's a much more colorful place uh, because they still aren't finding this in the textbooks, but they can tell us different story that's in the textbooks that's truer and helps them understand what's going on around them. And that's, and that's what we wanna do. When the kids ask me, why do I gotta learn this? We can say, this is why you have to learn this. You have to learn this. So if you wanna to understand today, you have to look at what happened in the past. And if we can do that, then we can begin to make a better future. And, and so this project allows us to do that. It's, it's exciting for the kids to write their own histories. The teachers are, are wizards. They, they can just do things. Kids, I, if I told you how many poems we heard, because they wrote papers about the enslaved people, but then they wanted to share their feelings. And poetry allowed them to share their feelings. And, and this past year was so enlightening. And then in the middle of COVID, I still have people calling me up saying, can we take on this really hard task? Can we take on this new curriculum that we as teachers don't know anything about and, and move it forward. And so I'm, I'm gratified that, uh, and grateful that they continue to come to us and ask us to do that work. And I and thank you for inviting me here today. And any questions? Oh. Yes. 